Hi everyone, welcome to our last alumni Hilly Chase of the school year. And we are pleased to welcome Peter Melnick, who graduated from here in 1984. So he grew up in Deerfield on a farm just down the road called Barway Farm. And it's his family's farm that was started in 1919. Like I said, he graduated from Eagle Brook in 1984. He went on to Deerfield Academy and then to the University of Vermont. His path then led him back to his family's farm, and he took over operations of, of Barway, which he, which he does with his father um, in the early 2000s. And Peter's son, Henry, graduated from Eagle Brook in 2018. Um, while he was at Eagle Brook, the following was written about him. Peter is a remarkable young man who throughout his entire career at Eagle Brook has worked from two to four hours each day on the family farm while being an outstanding scholar athlete. In addition, his classmates every year have recognized his leadership and integrity by electing him to the student council. The assessment continued on saying, Peter's ambition is to be a farmer or to work in a field which would help to improve modern agriculture throughout the entire world. Um, Barway Farm started as a 20 acre farm uh, growing tobacco and onions and it's now expanded to about 750 acres, probably more now, and grows everything from butternut squash, hemp, pumpkins, cattle feed, and currently has approximately 500 cows. Um, about half of those are milking cows, dairy cows. Um, in 2017, Peter installed a methane digester on his farm. What's a methane digester? He's gonna tell you. Um, what you need to know about this machine is it makes his farm more sustainable and provides electricity not only for the farm, but enough to go back to the electrical grid. So Peter Chocolate's a great intro for our upcoming Global Day on May 4th. And let's welcome Mr. Melnick here. Thank you, Skyler. Um, I think I should have just let you keep going. You were on a roll there. You, you did about half my speech. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. I am really excited to be here. I know exactly what it was like. I went to Eagle Brook for four years. I know that it's the end of the day. Sports are over. You've had dinner. Now you've got to listen to some alumni tell you about cow manure. <laughs> So um, I will try to make this brief, entertaining. Um, at the end, I'll, have, I'll let you guys ask me some questions. Uh, I guess I'll begin, you know, Skylar told you a little bit about myself. I sat in your seat. Um, Eagle Brook was a great time for me. One of the things that I loved about Eagle Brook is that we spent a lot of time outside. We were always out in nature. Whipple Pond, up, in the, up on the rock, down in the valley, down in the Deerfield River, they were always something to do outside. And it's been a part of Eagle Brook since the beginning. And it helped me, I was always connected to what was going on at our farm, but Eagle Brook taught me about some of the things that go on up here and how every environment is different. So I went on to Deerfield and then the University of Vermont. At the time I was at University of Vermont, Bernie Sanders was the mayor of the town of Burling, of the city of Burlington. And sustainability was becoming a catchword at the time. And the University of Vermont was leading the way in what is now a huge field of sustainability. And I really, really kind of took notice of it as well as I was studying about cows and business and economics, how sustainability was just, it was growing and growing. So Skylar called me up a couple weeks ago and said, we'd love to have you come back and give a hilly chase and kind of set the stage for Earth Day, which Global Day, which is coming up. And Eagle Brook does a fantastic job with getting you guys out there. And I, in my bio, one of the things I wrote down is, and I hope this is the one thing that you take away from today, I am a terrible recycler. I am the worst, my kids yell at me all the time. I always throw the cans in the trash and I don't separate the paper. But the one thing that I do do is that 
I've tried to be the best recycler on my farm. So I may not be good at the cans, and I'm working on it, but I am try every day to think of ways to make my farm more sustainable and how we can use recycling to make our farm more profitable and more environmentally friendly. So I w what I want you to take home today is you don't have to necessarily be good at, you know, the things that everybody else does. Just find something that interests you about the environment that you can partake in and just do it. So after, after I um, graduated from college, I came back to the farm and we were always, we were milking cows, we were growing some vegetables, but I wanted to figure out a way to make the most of our cows. And uh, as you can see in the picture here, that's an aerial view of the farm, and Eagle Brook is off way up in the distance. Kind of an interesting side note, my family started our farm about the same time that Thurston Chase started Eagle Brook. So to give you some perspective, our farm has been growing and developing in almost the same way that Eagle Brook has for 100 years from a small little school. We had a small little farm. Now we are a big farm, bigger farm with a digester owning more land. And Eagle Brook has gone from you know, being a small little school with, was there, 20 kids the first year to everybody here in this room and the great facilities that we have here today. I'm the fourth generation. Um, the man in the middle is my father, Steve. He spent his 75 years of his life working the farm in Deerfield. And then um, to the left is him is my son, Henry, who graduated in class of 18. And he actually right now is taking a gap year and is working on the farm right now so I can come and speak to you guys. <laughs> so in 2010, I really started getting into methane digestion. And what metha methane digestion is, or another word for it, is anaerobic digestion. It's basically digestion w without any oxygen. And I spent almost seven years trying to develop the project. And you say, why would it take seven years? You can, if anyone here has solar panels, you just, you, figure out where you're gonna put the solar panels, you find somebody to, to put them up on your house or on your field and then you connect it to the grid and it's done. When I started the methane project on my farm, it was a relatively new thing. And at the time, there was only about 100 methane digesters in all the farms in the United States. And the success rate of the digesters that were running was only 10%. So that means for every digester that, every 10 that were built, nine of them were failing. So I wanted to somehow figure out how to make this work. I also had to help, um, me and some other farmers had to help the state figure out how we could permit them because there had not been any built in Massachusetts. So there were no rules or regulations. So about three farmers, myself and two other farmers, helped the state regulators to decide um, what rules and regulations would be put in place to build a digester. Typically, methane digestion has been going on for years. We could actually build one on campus if we took a 50-gallon drum and you put a lid on it and then we sent all everybody out and collected all the dog poo on the lawn. If we filled that 50 gallon barrel up with, with uh, dog poo it w and put the lid on it, eventually the anaerobic digestion process would start in there and a little bit of gas would come off, probably enough so Mr. Fox could cook dinner for himself. So I'm not sure if we really want to try that experiment, but it's it's really been going on for a long time and it can be very simple. As I learn more and more about what makes the process effective, I went to Europe and in Europe, they do a lot of work. They actually add food waste 
to the cow manure or the chicken manure or the hog manure. And the reason that they're doing that is because the animals, especially cows, they actually have digesters in their stomach and they eat corn and hay, soybeans, and they take all that energy and they make fat if they're beef cows or milk if they're milk cows. And then they get rid of the excess. But that food waste, cow food, has already been the energy, most of the energy has been taken out. But when you take food waste, the scraps from the dining hall or from a large food manufacturing plant where they have um, things that they have to discard, that still has energy. So for example, our digester is built to take, um, there is a plant in Northampton, they actually make Gatorade there. And there's times where they have, um, the, the recipe doesn't work right, and they bring trailer truck loads of Gatorade. You can think of anything with any more energy than that, and that we mix it with the cow manure, and that together makes electricity. Kind of getting a little bit of my head of myself here. So this is my son Henry and I in the cow barn. So this is the cow barn and one of the storage tanks. You, many of you may have ridden by the farm on your bicycles. Um, we are, like I said, about two and a half miles down the road from here, and you can actually see our farm perfectly from the rock. So this is the aerial view, and you, you can see the barn where all the cows, most of the cows, the milk cows are housed. And you can see three round tanks, and that's where the, the material goes after it's been digested. But there's two bubbles, and that's where the actual digester is. So what I want to do now is talk to you about the actual process of what we're doing and what it actually accomplishes for our farm. So the cow manure comes out of the cow barn and is pumped underground to the AD tanks. That's the anaerobic digestion tanks. They are a million gallons. So that tank holds a million gallons and it is always full. And it is kept at 105 degrees temperature and that's where the microbes work most effectively. Basically what's happening in there is we're pumping the cow manure in and the food waste and at 105 degrees the microbes are most effective and they're basically in simple terms they're farting the little microbes fart the bubble catches the farts this is like perfect seventh grade conversation <laughs> and because um, I know you guys have farted before <laughs> and the uh, the gas goes from the bubble into the CHP where there is a big engine. And any of, you, any of you have a generator at your house, this is basically a huge, huge version of your, um, your home generator. So the gas, which is CH4, which is methane, is sucked into the engine and the engine is 1,800 horsepower. So your car engine is anywhere from 100 to 300 horsepower. This is 1,800. It is about um, a quarter of the size of this room. It is a big engine. And that engine runs a generator, which then puts electricity back onto the grid and also powers the actual digester and our farm. So you can see the receiving area. That's where the trailer trucks back up and dump the loads of Gatorade. Um, the food waste that we take, just for, to give you an idea, we take waste from Coca-Cola, Cape Cod potato chips, Hood ice cream, Friendly's ice cream, Ben and Jerry's, um, Whole Foods, all the waste from the back of Whole Foods market. Almost any major food manufacturer in the Northeast, there's a chance that they could be bringing their food waste to our facility. We take 100 ton a day. To give you an idea, all the waste that comes out of the back of the Eagle Brook Dining Hall is probably less than one ton a week. And we bring in 100 a day. So it's a lot of material. 
And then the cows themselves, the 550, 600 cows that we have, all their manure, the manure from them is going in there. That equals about 300, or 30 ton. And all that is going into the digester and it spends about 30 days in there. Basically, we are pumping in all the time and it's overflowing. From the digester, it goes into the screw press room. In the screw press room, we separate the liquids and the solids. What we do with the, the solids is we actually, it's fibrous. It looks kind of like peat moss or compost. And we use that as bedding for the cows. So we get to recycle again. And then the last part of the journey for the material is it goes into the nutrient storage tank, the big blue tank in the back. And we basically store the material in those storage tanks for um, six months because we can't spread, we spread it on the crops, we, on the fields that we grow, the corn, the hay, the hemp, the butternut squash, the pumpkins, all our crops that we grow. We use it as fertilizer and it's totally organic and natural and we don't have to buy any chemical fertilizer to grow all of our crops, which has been a huge change for our farm because we used to buy chemical imp inputs. So now we're doing it all totally with natural and organic material that's coming from this process. One of the things that we also are excited about this process, and, and this is an important thing to think about sustainability. Most of you here may not have ever been on a dairy farm or ever milked a cow or even know what a cow smells like, but it may not be um, exactly, um, smell like roses, should I say. And in 100 years ago, most people knew someone that lived on a farm, had relatives that owned a farm, or had even worked on a farm. But as we become larger and more urban, less people are educated about what goes on in animal agriculture. Our neighbors, Deerfield has 5,000 residents, and our neighbors become, over time, have become less tolerant of the smell of the cow manure. Luckily, through this process, we have, we take the methane and the sulfur, which is the stinky part, and we burn that in the, in the, the engine room. So when we apply the manure in the digestate, we call it, in the nutrient storage tanks to our fields, we're doing it right now, actually, in the spring, and then we do it in the fall after we've harvested the crops, the, the nutrient actually it reduced the odor by 90%. So how is that sustainable? Well, if your neighbors don't want you because you stink, that's not, eventually they're all, they're gonna say, hey, we don't want that farm here anymore. It's a nuisance to us. So we really felt that of one of the biggest benefits that we've gotten, one of the most things that, one of the things that has made us sustainable is the lack of smell on our farm. And it's been great. And I really think that eventually almost all manure in the United States will be digested because of one of the, because of that reason, um, because the odor control works wonderfully. So just, uh, there's a picture of the, the, the tank full, the blue tanks full of nutrients. Um, and here's the, the digester working. And you can see the fields out back, that's where we'd be applying um, the nutrients. So just to kind of go over what we have, uh, what we get out of this process, we get electricity. We make enough electricity for to power the the digester. Our milking farm, our barns, and our houses at the farm, and basically 1,500 residential homes, which is almost all the houses, not including the businesses in the town of Deerfield. And we're doing all this from wasted food and cow manure. The other things that we get is we get the reduction of odor. We get the sustainability of being a better neighbor. We get nutrients to fertilize our fields. We also get heat. The the CHP, the engine, makes an incredible amount of heat. 
and we use it to keep the digester at 105 degrees. But the next phase in our sustainability is we're hoping to build a greenhouse and use that heat in the wintertime to grow another crop on our farm. Because basically right now we are just blowing that air through a radiator and wasting it. So there again, we're going to try to be more sustainable, use all the nutrients, use all the products that this process can generate to help our farm. The, uh, the other part that we talked about is the cow bedding. We used to have to buy bedding for our cows, um, and now we save a lot of money because we're recycling that fiber, and it just keeps going round and round in the cycle, helping the cows um, be more comfortable and saving our farm money for not having to buy bedding. So <clears throat> what have... You know, what have I learned in this process? Um, one of the things that was, besides being a good neighbor, has been a huge bonus. The, one of the things that I learned, and I'm from a different generation than you, but it is amazing. I remember I talked about the success and failure of these digesters. It was about 90% failure. I think... One of the biggest differences, now there are, I think there's 400 now in the United States since 2010. And it's, it's predicted that, the, that that will go to 4,000 in the next five years. The thing that is driving this, besides the food waste and people wanting to be more efficient with our waste products, is technology. I can operate the whole digester from my iPhone. I can be anywhere that I have internet service. I can turn the engine on, shut it off, turn the pumps on, monitor it. 20 years ago, that was impossible. And really what it's doing is, this is a living, breathing thing. The digester is alive. If something goes wrong and we don't feed it, it runs just like you. If your parents or Eagle Brook don't, doesn't feed you for four or five days, you're going to run out of energy. This is the same thing. The bugs run out of energy. But we can monitor it um, all the time with technology. There's over 500 sensors in this system, and I can monitor what's going on all the time. And that really has made these things be more efficient, but also <clears throat> because it's alive, you can just run it so much more efficiently. And that has really changed the, the uh, effectiveness of the methane digestion process. The other thing that I've learned is that I talked about how I'm not good at recycling the soda can. But what I have learned is, is that I'm really good at recycling lots and lots and lots of food waste. And it's really important, you know, like I said, to take away is that you you should just look at your little, I looked at my little spot in the world. It's right down the hill from Eagle Brook. You guys can see me every day. And I said, what can I do to do my part on my farm to make it the most environmentally sustainable possible, but also <clears throat> just to be a good neighbor and to make the land and the surroundings better. <clears throat> we used to import all our fertilizer from overseas, now I make it myself. Just think about how much more efficient that is. So what I challenge you guys to do is to, you know, maybe you'll be better at the soda cans than I will, and you'll figure out something great to do with soda cans that they haven't figured out yet. Or maybe it's putting solar panels on your, on your um, house when you have a house someday or challenging your parents to do something environmental at your home. Or when you're in the professional world, think of something, some way to make the place where you are better, more efficient, more sustainable. The other thing that I've really learned, and this is hard to understand when you're in seventh, eighth, ninth grade, but Skylar talked about how when I went to Eagle Brook, I used to get up before school and milk cows. And sometimes I would do it after. 
And one of the things that that taught me to do was to work really, really hard. And sometimes it doesn't seem like you're going anywhere. I know you guys have that feeling here. Like, what, why am I studying this? I'm never going to need this. Well, it teaches you to work hard. And I talked about how it took seven years just to, to permit it, build it, and find the money to build it. Because this project cost $8 million to build. And I didn't have $8 million at the time. So seven years is a long time to not have anything really happen. But you, I just keep chugging away at it. And now I look back at it and I think that that was some of the most valuable time that I ever spent, those seven years of digging deep, trying to find answers to lots of questions. Because I knew at the end, the result was going to be you know, what I wanted it to be. And the cows are happy that we did it too. So <laughs> um, I just uh, wanted to take some questions. Um, Skylar? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so what, what would be preventing every water treatment facility across the country or across the world from doing something like that with, um, like human waste, like instead of cow manure, why not human manure? So <clears throat> they do actually do some of this at, um, in some cities in America, they do do it now. Um, the problem is, uh, with the human waste is two, uh, twofold. Usually it's not, one of the advantages that our digester has is our, the land to apply the nutrients are, is right, right in our backyard. So you have to truck the nutrients away because a lot of material comes in, then you have to bring it out. The other thing is with human waste, there's lots of contaminants, heavy metals, all the cleaning agents that we use, if there's any industry in the towns. So land applying the nutrients is a little bit more complicated. It's a good question, though. So the cows really is a is sort of a sweet spot for that. We do spend a lot of time, as noted, every all the food, even though it's quote unquote waste, we sample every load that comes in to make sure that it is meets the specifications that it needs to. Because the digester is like a big stomach, and if you feed it the wrong things, it'll actually it will get sick. Do you have more milk cows or beef cows? We have uh, mostly dairy cows. So yeah, we, we ship milk. Um, some of our milk actually may end up at Eagle Brook or lots of local grocery stores handle our milk. Um, but we do have a few beef cows, but mainly dairy. These are dairy cows. Um, where did you find the influence to uh, take on such a big project that you thought might not work? Oh, so how did I do the research? So, um, actually, it's funny that you say that. Uh, a friend of mine, he's a friend now, he, he was a, a developer, and he came forward to me with this idea, um, a developer, a businessman from Boston, because uh, the state of Massachusetts was, at the time, beginning to implement a food waste ban. So um, that really is what kind of pushed, start, started this going because I knew about um, methane digesters but their track record was horrible um, but a developer came to me and actually said hey they have, their Massachusetts has a food base ban so any company that makes over a ton a week um, could no longer just put their material in to a landfill they had to bring it to a methane digester or a composting facility um, so there was an opportunity there and then it led me on the process. It's good. That's a good, good, um, good question. Um, why do you think that there are so little farms using it? And are there certain parts of America that there are more than others? I'm, I'm blown away by the questions. <laughs> you guys must have been paying attention. Um, so actually Massachusetts per 
capita per farm has more methane digesters than any other state um, because we have so few farms. But um, the food waste ban in Massachusetts has really driven it to uh, the numbers to be, there's actually eight digesters in Massachusetts. Um, we also have a high electricity rate. Um, it is taking off in other areas of the country now. California is basically regulating everyone to do it. It's more or less driven by the, the state's, state's regulations. Some, some places like Florida have poor environmental um, standards and their electricity rate is much, much lower. So um, the feasibility of doing it is, is doing, is, uh, becomes harder in a state. There's no incentive to do it in a state like Florida. But in Massachusetts, California, Texas is actually taking lots of steps to do it. Um, Wisconsin is a big dairy state. They're trying really hard to do it. Vermont um, had a big push in the beginning. They've actually s slowed down. One of the big drivers is Massachusetts has 100 dairy farms. And there's 6 million people generating food waste. Vermont has 1,000 dairy farms and only 600,000 people. So it's kind of a, number, a numbers thing. Massachusetts is a great, great um, spot for that because we're so close to the uh, population. How does the plant generate electricity? How does the plant? OK, so basically, you mean the, the actual digester? So yeah, just uh, the, the gas t runs the turbine and uh, the generator, and then it puts it onto the grid. Uh, you said that like nine out of 10 uh, digesters uh, didn't work. And uh, what did you do different for like your digester to work? Uh, or did you just get lucky? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I did my homework, because I remembered that was important at Eagle Brook. <laughs> No, um, I think, like I said, the technology has really evolved. Um, the other thing is I chose some really good partners. I partnered with a company called Vanguard. Um, I was their, actually their first um, partner, farm partner digester, and they're actually on course now to build um, 100 in the United States in the next three years. So their company is, they, I was the first one that they partnered with. They actually run the digester for me on a day-to-day -day basis, and they're in charge of bringing in all the food waste. So I'm just like, almost like a silent partner, although I do am very active because I did help start the company. Um, but uh, the technology is huge too, because it just, the, tech, the, the science is pretty simple, but making it work all the time and be effective, um, I can't overemphasize how much the uh, technology is, but even simple little things. Um, so you'll notice the digester. The digester tank is actually an oval, and it's a good one for physics. So they used to make them round, and the material is mixing in there all the time. With two, with ours has two big boat props, big propellers, and it they raise up and down, and they mix a million gallons. They keep it in suspension all the time. And what happens over time is that the sediments fill up in this tank, and eventually the sediments fill up so much that we have to shut the system down for almost a year. By the time we shut it down, clean all the sediments out, and then start the whole process up. So for a year, we're not making any money. What they did is they used to make them round, but round, the material settled in the middle, and it took three pumps, mixers, to mix it because you're always, you're always mixing, you're always pushing against the wall, the material in a round tank. In an oval tank, it's like a racetrack. You, the mixer sends the material down the racetrack, goes around the corner, loses energy, and then we push it again. So we only have two mixers. Those two mixers, uh, that by eliminating one 50-horse electric motor, instead of two, instead of three, if you multiply the amount of electricity that that uses over the 25 year lifespan, that's a huge savings. That's just a little tweak of engineering that makes the system better. They're figuring that by using an oval tank, 
a round tank they had to shut down every five years and clean out. We're hoping to go 10 years just by changing the design. So that's really just little things like that over time have made a big difference. Um, in the picture, it looks like it's full. If the if there wasn't any material in there, would the black bubbles like deflate? No, that's uh, great. So those actually go up and down all the time. Um, when it's running well and it's make, it's farting a lot, um, when it's full beans ahead, like it, it, uh, it the bubbles are are full. And if the pump actually that pumps the food waste especially shuts down for a half an hour or is broken that you can actually see the bubbles will go down so yeah it is it's alive uh, how many cows uh, did you have when your family only start a farm and uh, how many cows do you have like now. Yeah. Um, so when we started, we were mainly a vegetable farm. We used to grow onions. Lots of onions were grown in this valley and tobacco for cigars. Um, and we had just probably 10 cows. And my great, my grandfather um, and great grandfather, they milked by hand. And now we have machines um, that milk them. And we have uh, 350 milk cows and then about 200 young stock. Um, so you can see how it's grown. And we're actually talking about installing robots, and the robots would actually milk the cows. So there you go, technology changing the world. Who else works on the farm with you? So um, we are a family farm. My father is still active. He's there every day at um, 4 o'clock every morning. And... Uh, I am in charge of the business part, and I do most of the uh, crop work, the field work. And my brother, um, he's in charge of all the animals. And my son is there. He actually is learning how to do all the jobs. Um, and we have two full-time milkers, and then we have two full-time people that help do all the crop work. And in the fall time when we're harvesting, we can have up to um, 20 people. We actually, um, the first year we grew hemp, we had, um, I think this might be a record, Mr. Chase, but we had two, um, good, is it good, is that what, good fellows? Yeah, we had two good fellows working for us in the same, uh, same year. So we were proud of that. <laughs> Are there any negative side effects to the digester? Yes, um, every, <laughs> there is. <laughs> um, so here's one to think about. Plastic. Plastic is a tough thing to separate from the food waste. And we have really strict standards in what we bring in, but even the littlest amount of plastic, it ends up on our fields. And over time, you know what happens to plastic, it doesn't break down or it takes thousands and thousands of years. So we are always trying to get rid of any tiny amount of plastic. But that is, that is a big challenge, is to keep the plastics out of the nutrient stream. So what would you have you done if your $8 million and seven years long project failed? <laughs> <laughs> what would we have done? Uh, I probably wouldn't be here tonight talking about the <laughs> sustainability. Um, uh, no, so I had uh, I had investor an investor, and he would have lost his money, and I put a lot of time and money into it myself. So um, that was uh, th that was definitely you know was a big consideration. Um, that is probably one of the reasons why there isn't so many digest there isn't uh, more digesters in America is because financially um, the the failure rate was you know ninety percent not many banks or investors were interested in that 
Um, luckily, mine um, thought that we had the right technology, we had the right regulations, the right um, setting in Massachusetts, and the numbers seemed to work good. Um, and it actually has worked, it has um, turned out to be a good investment for us. But yeah, it does happen. Uh, have there ever been times when you have to save uh, the methane that you gather, like for cell, or is it just used for uh, self-use? So, um, so yeah, so the bubbles can only hold so much, and we can't store it. Um, we could actually compress it, and basically when you, you know, in your gas grill, you have a tank full of gas. Basically, methane is this, this is the same, almost the same as propane, um, but you would have to compress it, and that's like a whole other process. What we do when, like for instance, when the engine needs to have its oil changed, we um, have a flare, and if you drive by the farm, sometimes you'll see the, there's like a, we're actually burning the methane, because um, if we just let it go into the air, it would smell pretty bad. Over the uh, last 20 or 30 years, um the dairy industry has grown and become very efficient, and there are very large farms that are producing a lot of milk. And unfortunately, those farms have pushed out the family farms. And I think, uh, obviously, uh, you've done something to solidify your family farm. Uh, is this, I'm sure you're helping Vanguard and others, but is this the model that's potentially going to help many other family farms throughout the nation? So, yeah, one of the keys um, that I've learned about sustainability um, is that you can't just be, like, focused on one thing. And those really big farms that you talk about, they're really focused on making milk. And our family, we, our, we only milk 300 cows. There's farms that have 30,000 cows. And it's hard to compete with them on an efficiency standpoint. But um, one of the things the digester has done is made us be more diverse. So our income is coming from electricity. It's coming from the food waste that we get, actually get paid to take in. Um, we're saving on fertilizer. Uh, you know, we're really t and we're really taking advantage of most of the big farms are way out in the middle of nowhere where we're close to Boston, New York City, Connecticut a major metropolitan area. So that's really plays to the small farms, the, our size farm, um, you know, what we have to offer. So yeah, that's, I think it is a model. It, and I think the digester can work on any farm um, if you have the right um, rules and regulations in your area to, to make it effective. I have to say, I have hundreds of dairy farmers from all over the country come and look at our site, and some of the questions they ask are not as good as the ones you guys are giving tonight, so. <laughs> How do you think farming as a business is gonna evolve in the next 50 to 100 years? So, I think really the, um, the thing I keep talking about is technology. Um, what happens on the farm, you know, like GPS in your car, they were using that on farms before you were, had them in your car. Um, cloning happened on the farm first. It's almost like that's where the, the experimental ground is, in, is in agriculture before it comes to the human side. And we're seeing that now with, um, you know, like the Beyond Burger stuff where they actually make, um, make meat um, in a Petri dish in a simple way. Um, the science, the technology is changing all the time. Um, cows are so much more efficient than they were. Um, we actually, as a country, compared to 100 years ago when Eagle Brook started, um, there's like, I think it's, the number is like, 10 times less the number of cows in the United States than there is now. And there's a lot more people. And we're able to do that because the cows just are so much more efficient. 
and you're going to see more and more of that. But you're also going to see technology change things with, with things like, um, you know, meat being produced and even milk being produced um, in laboratories. Whether or not people will accept that as, as something they want to eat, I'm not sure, but um, I think that's where we're headed. Are we good? We're good.